return to season five of uh, Magnum PI. It's funny. I remember interviewing you when the show first debuted for our fall preview for Yahoo years back. And, and I, the question I know you kept getting all the time, and I had to be the one to ask it too, unfortunately, was the mustache thing. That was all. That was the thing you had to put up with for a long time. When did you feel you finally escaped that? That Magnum, your Magnum, didn't have to worry about the mustache question anymore. I think it was after the first season. You know. Uh, People tuned in and they're like, okay, mm -hmm. new look, new vibe, new dude. Uh, I'm digging it. Let's go for another season, you know? And they show, they've shown up and supported us. Right. So here we are, season five. So something worked. I right. guess uh, <laughs> the, the mustache wasn't an essential quality to the character. <laughs> Well, you know, so many shows have tried to reboot popular franchises and they haven't always succeeded. Yours really has worked. What do you credit that to? What's your, what's your, what do you credit the Magnum's longevity to? It's a lot of things. I think, I think, um, you know, I think there's been some fun writing. I think the casting choices were solid. Um, you know, uh, whatever I'm doing <laughs> seems to be working. Um, you know, I brought my own flavor to the character and, uh, and it's a lot of fun, you know? So I, I, it, I think it's, it's one of those things where you turn on TV and there's, it's so heavy, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of madness. There's a lot of like rhetoric and politics and even shows are just like, everyone's just like mur getting murdered and everything. And there's a bit of levity on this show. You know, it's all not heavy. There's some, you know, it pokes fun at itself sometimes. Uh, it knows what it is, and um, I think it's a bit of escapism, too, for people. Um, it's like spending 45 minutes on the island uh, with some people that you would want to hang out with, you know? Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think those qualities are, are the reason why we've been around for so long. Now, and and you've started, you've moved behind the camera too as the show's gone on. You directed last season and again this season. Is that part of your way of taking ownership over the show too? Really making it feel like your your show that way, being involved in that at that creative level. Absolutely, I feel like uh, you know, I know this show intimately. I mean, I've lived in in these shoes for five years now or whatever it is. Uh, I've I've read every script. I've read every scene. I've been in almost every scene. Um, I have a bank of knowledge and information about it. So uh, if, if anybody could speak about it, you know, I, I definitely am sort of an, an authority, right? <clears throat> and, and directing is, has, is something I've really been wanting to do for a long time. And I've worked, I've gotten a chance on the, on the film side to work with some really great directors. And, uh, you know, being exposed to that has taught me a lot. And also sort of, digesting, consuming, producing, making uh, almost 100 episodes of television, that teaches you a lot. That's a school and an education in and of itself. Uh, so I felt like I was ready and um, uh, I just wanted to dive in. And, you know, uh, I, Eric, the showrunner, he's it, 418, the episode I directed last season, is one of his favorite mm -hmm. episodes uh, of the entire show. Um, yeah. So I had a lot of fun doing it. It was a, it was a great sort of departure in terms of, you know, the story that we told. We brought back a, a character who was from the pilot and uh, in, a, in a really interesting way. It wasn't a ghost. It was like, you know, a figment of, of Magnum's imagination during this time of stress. Right. So it was really fun devising um, a way visually to tell that story, because also you didn't want it to feel like it was such a departure that it felt like something other than Magnum PI. So we had to sign, uh, fi find a way to sort of finesse that and massage that uh, so it felt organic and not like, uh, you know, something totally different. I remember one of your first experiences in network television was the show Six Degrees, which I remember when that aired. It, the first, it, was, it was a great pilot. You had an amazing buzzy cast and you had, you know, it was, it was a prime a prime time slot and everything. And it was like the hopes were big and then it didn't last. It, it, it was canceled after. What did that experience teach you as you came into, you know, have a show that's now lasted five seasons? Well, it's it, it teaches you how how hard it is to find success on network television. First of all, how many pilots get shot every season by every network? Hundreds? I mean, I don't even know what the answer is. But the chance of even getting picked up and then making it past like that, like 13 episode mark or something, super right. unlikely. Then make to make it a full season, then to like get another one and another one and another one. It's just like, it doesn't happen, you know? And, and like you said, it was a buzzy cast. It was New York. We had great mm -hmm. writers um, and, and it still didn't, Last beyond, I think it was 13 or 14 episodes. I, I, I don't remember.
Yeah, but and now here, but now you've got a hundred, so you you've hit yeah. the you hit the hundred club. Yeah. You know that yeah, feels like that. <laughs> it's, it's so crazy! It's so crazy! Right. It's such a a, a a massive amount of work, you know. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> well, let's jump back into some of your, your roles from the past as our role recall section. So uh, the, the first one I want to start off with, your first major movie was Crazy Beautiful in 2001. And when I, when I, said, when I told my uh, fellow uh, writers I was going to interview you, that movie came up so often. That, that is a huge movie for millennials, especially, I think. <laughs> that romance with you and Kirsten. And, and what's so interesting about that, like so much of that movie is Kirsten Dunst really trying to change her screen image at the time after Bring It On and everything. She was doing something darker. And you were really her partner in that. What was it like as, as you know, your first major movie, watching this established star play something completely unlike herself. I saw a professional, right? That's the that's the way I saw it. I was I was green. I was new in the industry, um, and and I saw somebody so wholly committed to the process, and not only committed to the process, but committed to making somebody um, who was maybe not even fully prepared for what I, what was on my plate. To, to making them a partner, you know, she just taught me so much and I learned so much by, by watching her, you know, perform and how she uh, carried herself um, uh, uh, on set and with the crew and how she interacted with people. I, it was just for me, it was a huge education and she's an amazing talent and she's been around since she was a child and she still continues to surprise us with characters and roles. And uh, it was, yeah, it was a great, it was, it was a great experience for me and kind of like set me off in, in, uh, in Hollywood, you know, and, and kind of gave me a roadmap as to, to, to how to move forward and how to act on set and how to be on set and how to try to find uh, a breathe life into, into characters. And, and you have to do some very intimate scenes with her at that time too. And this was in a day before intimacy coordinators and things like that, that you have There was now. no coordinators whatsoever. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right. <laughs> what was that like? I mean, how did you make each other comfortable having to do some of those more intimate scenes together? It was the strangest thing I'd ever done. You know, like there's a term for what we would wear that's not politically correct. You can't even say the term anymore, but there's a sock that we used to wear. And uh, I, I got to set and I was just like, oh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, do, I'm we're doing this. All right, fine. Okay, I, I just roll with the punches, you know? Um, it was wild. And then on top of that, you have a bunch of crew guys and boom operators and cameramen walking around. There's nothing sexy about it. Uh, but uh, like I said, it was an education. Well, you go from that to Ladder 49, where you have these two like established movie stars you're working with as a young actor. You have John Travolta, who's sort of old Hollywood, you know, the, the, the Saturday Night Live, all that, Saturday Night Fever, all that stuff. And then you have Joaquin Phoenix, who's this new, very methody type of uh, actor. And he's, you know, he has a very different process. As a young actor yourself, was it interesting to watch those two, you know, very different actors work together on set? What did you learn from being able to see both of those styles? It's interesting to, to be around, especially as a young actor, to be around a, a movie star. Right. So that was a new thing for me. And to see not only their process of, of you know, creating a character and living in that and, and shooting the movie, but also how they interacted with their fans. That was all new. And just you see how much they care. You know, I, I, I was just it's one, you know, one more thing about teaching you how to how to be an actor and be a celebrity or a star or whatever, you know, that sort of like. Um, uh, that 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 relationship you have with fame is, and 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 the people that support you essentially, right? So, understanding that relationship uh, through the eyes of Travolta and getting to know him, and how humble he was, and how wonderful he was, and how engaging he was to people that quote unquote don't matter, you know, it's like they they can't do anything for him, but he still gives himself to them. Like seeing that early on was really important, you know, um, and then. And then uh, getting to know Joaquin and, and know his process and understand who he was as a human being. I mean, you know, he's, he's a committed artist and I think he's one of the most talented uh, actors of our time. I, I, I believe that. I mean, I, the guy's, he's, he's, a, he's a beast. Um, but he's also, you know, uh, in some ways kind of a tortured dude, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but I, there's something very beautiful about him and about that story. And uh, I really got to know him uh, really well on, on the movie and we st stayed friends. And I haven't seen him for a couple of years, but I mean, I, I still I still got love for the guy. You know what I mean? When you see him in something like Joker, are you blown away that he transforms himself that radically for, you I'm know, not, to I'm not him? shocked. I'm not yeah, shocked. Right. I mean, yeah. I was blown away by the performance, but mm -hmm. I am not shocked in, in terms of anything that he would do. I just. 
he commits with every cell in his body. You know what I mean? Uh, he, he, uh, he embodies it, he internalizes it. And when you see him, uh, you know, kicking some dumpster on the Joker and, and about to like explain, he's, he's living that. It's not, he's not acting, he's being, and that is torture for him. I, I, I just know him enough that like, he's putting himself through hell to make that, uh, that character special and that movie special. Well, you're, you're part of two of the best sort of early 2000s sports movies, I think, that we get rewatched over and over, the Rookie one and the Friday Night Lights. And the, the, those are just two like classics of, of, of that era of the genre. So I have to ask, which is harder to do on, uh, on screen, baseball or football? Which was the harder? Uh, football. Oh, okay. <laughs> without, without a doubt. Yeah, it's definitely more intense. I mean, those hits. We had stunt guys, but I still took hits. I mean, I had a... I had to go to the hospital one time because I had like a 260 pound lineman just step on my ankle, you know, like just stepped on me, but I heard it pop and I was like, I don't know if it's broken or I snapped the, my Achilles or I don't know what's going on, but my ankle, you know, it looked like a, a, a bowling ball. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely football is harder to play. Uh, baseball is like, it's a walk in the park, man. I love it. it. You know, to play professionally is a different thing. To to, sure. to, to hit a ball out of the park, that's like, you know, these right. these people are are aliens. But, uh, you know, on set, you know, tossing the ball around and, and, and hitting and having pitchers, like, give you a perfect throw so you can crack it out of the park, that's totally different. You know, it, it was just, it was it was all fun. You also get to watch two really great actors there, Dennis Quaid and Billy Bob Thornton, do their version of the inspirational locker room speech. And you get to be an yeah. audience for, for both of those. What, what, what's it like having to do those scenes and watch the, these actors, you know, have to really deliver that line under multiple times, too? It's not just yeah. one time they're doing that speech. Well, it, it's, it's one of the things that, like, people don't understand is they think uh, actors go to set, they show up, they say, they say the lines one time, then they go home. It's like mm -hmm. a full day, you know, depending on what you're shooting, what you're doing. There's wides, there's coverage, there's, you know, you're turning around, you're, you're moving extras and background and all kinds of stuff. You got to do that speech a thousand times before you get it in the can and, and it's ready, you're ready to move on. So it's a process, right? It's a process. And to watch Quaid and Billy Bob Thornton do that, it, it's it, it like I said, I'm always learning. I'm always absorbing. I'm always watching. And it's funny because in this golf movie I referenced earlier, I kind of have one of those moments with a, a, a group of students uh, that I'm training in the game of golf. And so, yeah, like I had to sort of bring some of that, that, that little magic, you know, that, that they brought to those scenes on those days uh, to this film. So it's going to be cool to see a kind of like a full circle moment because in the movie, Dennis Quaid is my assistant coach. So it's like, you know, the, the, yeah, amazing. yeah, it's, wow. it's, it's a really, it's a really, it's a really kind of great story. <laughs> did you go to him and say, hey, do you, what, what, you, what when you did the rookie, did, can you give me any advice? <laughs> did, did you ask for advice? I just <laughs> remembered, I just remembered everything that he did and, and he was there right, and right. he was like, that's he was great. So supportive. And uh, he's like, just, just go for it, man. Just go for it. Do more. Like, who cares? He's like, we got <laughs> it. But, you know, he was just like really fired up about it. And, I love and it, it uh, it was just, it was really nice. It was really nice. I mean, he's such a lovely dude, man. I, right. I love him. I love him. <laughs> That's great. Uh, the one thing with the Friday Night Lights movie, I always forget they don't say clear eyes, full hearts can't lose in the film. That was a TV show thing. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton says, you know, things like it, but not that line. Were you were you sad you never got to have that chant? Because that's such a defining uh, uh, part of the TV show. They, they were both great, which is like, right. mm -hmm. it, it's such a rare thing to happen. I think it's rare that even that you they made a movie and a TV show about it, let alone they're both successful and have huge fan bases on, on either side. I mean, I get football players all the time tell me it's one of their favorite movies. You know, it's like, it's up there with like, remember the Titans and, you know, oh, classics, you know what I mean? Then you go to Hostel, which is interesting. And this is such a moment for horror, obviously. That this is this is sort of the the quote unquote torture porn era of horror. Were, were you were you always bothered by that uh, idea, that that, that that slogan that was attached to stuff like Hostel and Saw and all that? Did that, did that bother you at the time? At the time? It didn't bother me. I mean, if I'm gonna do a horror movie, I wanna do a horror movie. And if, if, if we're gonna go all in and get gory and like, slice people's Achilles tendons and rip out eyes and run people over like let bring it man I'm all I'm all I'm all for it um it was it was uh a, a, it was a hard movie to shoot getting tortured in a movie is just like getting tortured in real life you know so there were days that it was painful and uh cold and uncomfortable 
but uh, it was one of the best experiences I've had in terms of watching a film with an audience. On opening night, uh, it was a Friday night midnight showing. Uh, uh, myself, um, Eli, Quentin Tarantino, who was an executive producer on it, uh, Chris Briggs and Daryl Richardson, and I believe Mike Fleiss was there. We went and snuck into the Man's Chinese Theater for the midnight showing, packed audience, and snuck into the very back lane, uh, back um, row of seats. Nobody knew we were there. So nobody was clapping or freaking out because they knew Quentin Tarantino and Eli Roth were in the back. They were doing mm -hmm. it because they were genuinely like psyched and freaked out and, uh, and, and just like having raw visceral reactions to, to the film. And it was like so much fun. It was, it was a lot of fun. What do you remember about having your fingers severed? Was that one of those painful days or did they, did they take care when you had your fingers? I remember severed? like all those gags. I remember uh, it was just so cool. I was like, this is so much fun. You know, there was a scene where I, I snipped uh, one of the characters eyeballs out because it was hanging. And and you could probably edit this out if it doesn't work. But I, I, I coined it the eye gasm because of all the stuff that came out afterwards. Uh, so, yeah, it, we, we had some fun, man. We had a lot of fun on that set. Were you sad that your character didn't survive the sequel? You make it through the first one and then you're killed off in the beginning of the sequel. Were, were you like, I want Paxson to live. He should have, he should have survived. You no, know, it was probably a mistake on my part because uh, they wanted me to do star in the second one. And I, I you know, I had done a horror film and I just didn't want to become a horror guy. So I was like afraid of doing too much at the same time. So I was like, I don't want to, I, I turned down the movie. I, I said, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. And they begged, they begged me and, and, and they said, all right, can you at least let us kill you? And I was like, sure, let's do that. So I only, you know, I spent a couple of days in Prague and, and, and we, we had, you know, I think they, they severed my head and right. it was pretty fun. Uh, but uh, yeah, in retrospect, I should have just, should have just done the second film. <laughs> you know, it was too much fun. It was too much fun. Right. I was just afraid of, you know, the Hollywood's funny in that way. And if you do sure. too many horror films, it's like they're not going to, I'm not, I wouldn't have got, you know, some film with Oliver Stone a couple right. of years later or whatever. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's very easy to be pigeonholed. And so, yeah, you're always thinking like, yeah, right. Absolutely. You know, so, it's like a game of chess. So you always have to be smart about, about the moves you make, you know? Right. Absolutely. And, and then you get your you got a really big, uh, great lead role in the Carlitos Way prequel, uh, uh, where you where you get to play the younger version, of obviously, the Al Pacino character from from, from that uh, Brian De Palma film. Was that did you look back at Pacino's performance to do the younger version or did you? I totally um, did. Yeah, I watched I watched the original. I listened to his voice to try to uh, bring some younger version of that. I met with uh, a lot of the people because uh, Marty Bregman produced it. Right. So it was the same producer. And, and spoke with a lot of the same people that Pacino worked with in developing his character and understanding the story and New York City at that time. Um, uh, I worked with uh, Louis Guzman for the first time, and we ended mm -hmm. up doing another movie later called Humble Park, or no, uh, Nothing Like the Holiday. So I worked with him again after that, but this is the first time I got to work with him. And I've been such a huge fan of his for a long time. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was cool. I'll tell you what though, shooting in New York City in the winter with that wardrobe was the most painful thing. Cause it's like, you know, synthetic fibers don't keep the cold out, you know? Right. There were, there were <laughs> moments where I, I remember it was just so cold. I could hardly speak. I was having trouble saying, saying lines, saying dialogue because, you know, winds howling and, and, and it's probably like 22 degrees, but I just got like a light jacket on and a, a you know, it's just, it was, it was cold. There were some, there were some moments where New York really got to me. I was like, man, this is, this is some others. I'm born and raised in LA, you know, I'm not built for that. I'm not built not for that to. kind of cold, no. Well, this year it's been warm. So it'd be, this would be the perfect year to shoot that movie. So you wouldn't have that issue at all. It's not, right. You're going to be taking right. layers off to make it, to make it work. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because certainly Pacino uh, isn't, isn't a Latino actor. He played that role in, in 93. When you got to do it, were you glad that, that they made an effort to cast more Latino actors in that story uh, when you got to, to tell that? You know, it's been an interesting journey and it's been an in interesting evolution to see how Latin stories are told. Um, mm -hmm. They were always, it was always given to, you know, a white actor. Uh, or, or changed, it was just always changed, regardless of what the story is. It's always got to be that, and it's been that for, for a long time. And to me, it's just made no sense. You know, I, I, I look around, I'm like, all right, so I'm looking at the, the face of America, and, and I see who we are collectively, 
And I just don't understand why this massive segment who, who supports film and television in an outsized way, right? They, they, they go, their viewership numbers are higher than almost any other demographic. And it's like, why aren't, you know, we represented and not only represented, but represented in a positive light. It just made no sense. And for years I heard of this impending sort of a shift in the business. And it's like, oh no, it's the next thing. And, you know, Latins in Hollywood are gonna, you know, uh, uh, times are changing. And it was like that for years and years and years and years. And finally things are starting to sort of shift in a way that I think just respects this part of America in a way that it hadn't prior. And when I say that, we are as American as everybody else. So it always pissed me off. I was like, come on guys, knock it off. If I, if I watch TV, I would almost believe that you know, 40% of America was from England. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like all the actors are from, like, you look at film and television. Right. It's like, I guess, you know, I guess it's the biggest population in America is English people. Nothing against right. them, but, uh, you know, you just got to balance it out. You got to balance the scales, right? Well, certainly, you, you got the chance to be one of uh, DC uh, DC's first uh, Latino superhero uh, super villains in Suicide Squad, yeah, which yeah, is which is yeah. a great achievement. That movie, famously, the version that was released wasn't the version you exactly shot. Were were you? A, what was the behind the scenes of that like? Behind the the, the scenes, I was pissed off. <laughs> I was so mad. They called me up. They're like, "Oh, we're gonna do some reshoots, and you die." I was like, "What?" I was so angry. I remember being so pissed off. Um, uh, it wasn't. Uh, David's original vision. Um, he loved the character. He loved the character so much that he added stuff that wasn't in the original draft. I mean, we had a lot of fun. I I had a, an amazing time playing the character. It was so fun to, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because being Latin, being Mexican-American, growing up in LA, uh, early on in the career, it was like everything was like the auditions would be like for gang members or drug dealers or you know crap like that and uh and and i was like no 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 i spent a you know a, a big portion of the career say no to things like that and um that being said i knew i had that character in me but i had to reserve it for the right moment and uh and uh suicide squad came around and i was like this is it you know, I get to play in that space. It's going to be fun. It's super different. Um, it's it's like I mean, I kind of like disappear. You don't see Jay Hernandez in 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 the in the character. A lot of people don't even know that's me. Oh wow! So, <laughs> no, you really uh, do transform yourself. You got the tattoos and the and the face makeup and everything. Yeah, it's really it's quite a transformation. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot right. of fun. Do you support, I mean, certainly online, there's that push for people to release the Ayer cut, like there was released the Snyder cut. Would you like to see David Ayer's whole film released sometime, the original vision that he had? Uh, hell yeah, I would. I mean, look, um, you know, these studios hire directors because they believe in them, they believe in their vision, right? So you hire a guy like David Ayer, End of Watch, Fury, uh, he wrote tra Training, like you said, you hired him for those qualities right let let it be let it happen you know so i'm all about it like let's let's see the let's see the air cut right <laughs> love it <laughs> well you mentioned it earlier but but uh, uh home for the holidays was 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 one of the first sort of uh latino christmas movies christmas movies are a huge industry now uh i talked to freddie prince jr recently for his that he did for netflix and he was saying he'd been waiting to do one himself too that it just it was he was never offered that before what, right, were right. you aware at the time you made that how unique it was and, and, and how, how you were being a first that way with that film? I thought it was super unique. I did understand it. I, I love that I was, I was able to be a part of it. And the cast was amazing. It was like, you know, like Guzamo, Deborah Messing, um, uh, 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 Louis, um, Freddie. I mean, it was just, it was a great cast. It was a fun script. Um, and, and it was representation uh, in a way that you just don't see very often. And it was, I was proud to be a part of it. Yeah. And did you feel, I, I mean, I mean, certainly it balances sort of Christmas lightheartedness with some really dramatic story with your character, especially he has to decide whether or not he's going to kill someone. <laughs> that, that's your right, argument. Right. What was that balance, finding that balance between the sort of like the darker stuff and also the making it a Christmas movie? It's all, yeah, it, that's, you, I mean, you said it, it's all about balance, uh, mm -hmm. trying to, trying to bring honesty to the characters and, and in situations like that in neighborhoods like that. I mean, I grew up in one in LA and, and you do have that, that sort of, um, that juxtaposition of, of, of real wonderful things, real family oriented things that take place. 
next to, you know, crime and gangs and, and drugs and all that stuff. And that's the reality for a lot of people. So, you know, with all these things, I always try to bring um, a bit of reality, a bit of, uh, you know, sort of my backstory, whatever I got in, inside me uh, to these characters to, to, to make them breathe and, and to have an audience. You know, you, you want them to to be able to, it's like, you know, I, I see acting as a, as a, it's a journey in empathy, right? So uh, a lot of people judge actors because they, they want to save the world or they want to do good things or clean water in Flint or it's because we're empaths, right? We're, we're, we're always trying to, I mean, what our job essentially is to step in somebody else's shoes and live in that space and, and make it real. And so that's kind of like what we do on the daily. And, and I think as long as you're doing that and you bring a little bit of honesty uh, to the characters, people will watch the movie and will respond. Awesome. Well, thank you again for this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you taking the time to walk through uh, your movies with me. I, I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, it's a trip down awesome. memory, lane, memory lane for me, too. I mean, I haven't oh, watched some of these movies for a long time.